This is Bill McClellan, the uh, ball turret gunner on the uh, just a snapping. Oh, I see. Because it was electric, shoulder knife. They fired electric. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they, uh, yeah. you you turned it oh, I see. with a joystick. Well, and look, 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 yeah, and reach up like this. Right? You just turn it like this. Turn it like this. Up and down, and then you fire. Oh, I see. So we had a computing site. Had a computing site and uh, had a reticle in it, illuminated like this, and then. You kick your range pedal down, and you get down this the small, and then when you got about in here, you better be pouring it to him, babe, because you're going to give me the cannon. I bet you it was noisy in there. Well, not too bad. No, I see your, most of your noise is outside. It was in close. Okay. They're all tight. All tight. The plane itself must have been pretty noisy. Fairly. I was, it was, it was fairly quiet down there until I, until I got the guns going. Yeah. Did you ever get anybody? Yeah, I got a bunch. You got a bunch? Yeah. Seven. So you got seven? Seven. Seven planes you shot down? Yeah. I used to tell those 51 boys, they said, you go in those bomber outfits, don't go in head on, you look too much like a Messerschmitt. Slide in easy, baby. <laughs> so you, you, you shot in front of them, you let them? No, no, you don't lead them with that. It's a competing sack. Oh, you hung it right on them. You can get the best shot with a guy coming dead on. Oh, really? Yeah, and, and, he, and he has you too dead on, see? I, I didn't know they had computers and or computing and... Well, it wasn't really computing, but it was... Uh, Some kind uh, of... It was, uh, it was a little fancier. Now, see the boys in the waist and the tail gun and the radio gun, uh, they would uh, uh, they would just have to use their butterfly and use the ring of the post, see? Yeah. And, uh, but I used the sight. I had I had no no ring, no post. Cause I had a, I had twin fifties. I had a pair of them. Seven planes. What, what do you remember about Ev Blakely? Too much. What kind of a guy was he? He a one. He, he was like my older brother. Right? Yeah, he treated us fine. Couldn't beat him. Um, Ev said that you were uh, quite a shooter. I was a fair he shooter. He said you were pretty. Uh, Guy. Yeah, fair yeah. shooter. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think you guys were the real heroes of that war. No, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah. no. I couldn't do his job. Yeah. Well, There's no way I could sit up in that cockpit and fly that baby and sit there. And I'd feel like I was in my shorts if I didn't have those guns. Well, he was fantastic. Well, thank you. He was a real thank good pilot. Well, well, Jablonski said in his book, Double Strike, he was one of the best in the 8th Air Force, if not the best. A lot of good times, a lot of bad times. Over the targets, it was bad times. What was that like? Real hard, baby, real hard. Well, uh, Regensburg was a hard trip. To Africa, that was a hard trip. 11 hours and 15 minutes. We were up. E.A. Casamatis. I was in the same squadron as Everett Blakely. And I am holding a letter that Everett Blakely has sent to my sister after I was shot down flying for the 100th bomb group. And in the letter, he tells her why he can't send my dog home, which I stole going overseas in Newfoundland and took to England and raised. This was a big Husky, Eskimo Husky dog which became the mascot 
of the 418 squadron. So Blakely is writing my sister a letter in answer to her letter, telling her that he cannot send the dog home because it was wartime and there just wasn't any transportation. But what he's also perturbed about is that the dog loves to kill the farmer's chickens and he's getting much fatter than anything he could be eating in the chow line. And what, of course, when he went in the chow line, all the chow officers took good care of him. And that's it. The letter was from Reverend Blakely. Show the camera. Not only did Everett type it, he also censored the letter. <laughs> yeah, that's... Anyhow, like I said, he was upset because the dog was getting fat eating the farmer's chickens. And the letter, of course, was to my sister.
what, what was it like for the 100th bomb group after the war? Mm -hmm. Is that the right question? Sure. Uh, it was, was um, it's, the question produces uh, a, a lot of thought, or necessitates a lot of thought, because in the first place, it's been 50, more than 50 years, and a lot has happened. And, uh, and that, that's 50 years ago, but it's a time which was ex extremely important to us. It was, uh, it, it's a time which history has given a lot to. They call it, Studs Terkel call it the, the uh, only good war, the last good war. And um, the Time Magazine called uh, us the take charge generation. Uh, Roger Freeman said that, that my generation, our generation, the 100th Bomb Group generation, was the outstanding generation of the uh, of the higher history of the United States, second only to the founding fathers. So uh, these these were the kids who, yes, did win World War uh, World War Two, and it was important. And we went home, and and. And, and I've enjoyed following these people. I was the editor of Splasher Six, the, the newsletter, so probably more than anybody I knew what happened to them all. I knew the large number of them, uh, like my pilot, Ed Blakely, and, um, and that, that he stayed in, and a lot of people stayed in. Um, it, was, it was a terrific temptation to, uh, not to stay in because, in the first place, most of my friends, at least, had accumulated a lot of rank. I was a lieutenant colonel at the age of, of, uh, of uh, 25, and if I'd stayed in, I would have had a lot of tenure uh, to, to climb up. And, and, uh, and, and the people who stayed in uh, really did very well. I, I've kept up with them, and, and uh, I remember one of the, uh, the things that Gina and I thought about, we always heard that army brats were spoiled kids, but actually we followed the kids of the, the military people and the families of my military people were the ones who have done really spectacular. I could just go through the whole bunch of them. The kids have turned out to be doctors, and they've turned out to be um, uh, elected officials and, and corporation presidents and, and the like. So uh, that was a big share of our people. Uh, five of our group became brigadier generals, for instance. Uh, or, no, no, became generals. Jack Wallace and Fred Sutherland became one stars. and, and uh, uh, Tom Jeffrey and Bill Veal and uh, Jack Kidd became two-star generals. So um, speaking of the 100th as special, and, and I think I have to speak of the 100th as special because we were different and, and we, we got so tagged. I, uh, I have to think of the leaders. I think I, I, I must admit I'm, I'm completely prejudiced about my own pilot, uh, Ed Blakely, and uh, he, I, he was the best pilot there was. I, I could just give all kinds of evidence and, and the kinds of things he did, bringing planes home alone uh, when we were alone and the whole formation was gone and, and we would come home with uh, one engine gone and two engines gone and, and two engines feathered and dragging and, and then we would come home on one engine sometime and 2,200 holes in the plane. And, uh, so uh, I was very much interested in, in uh, uh, and Ev to know what would happen to him, and because I respected him so much, and he 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 dr uh, drew uh, a very difficult assignments, kind of a loner assignments. If you, for instance, um, uh, would wonder what somebody would draw for a terrible assignment, and yet in a right assignment, uh, what did Ev draw during the Vietnam War? He draw drew. An ROTC commission. So at the very height of the, the troubles in Vietnam, here he was, the head of the Air Force ROTC at Notre Dame, and very just involved. But he was such an, an easygoing, nice guy that nobody could could be anything but decent to him. And, and so he could preside over very serious meetings. And so he did that. And, and very, before I think even before he uh, joined the. The, the 100th bomb group, he was always in, already interested in South America, so he drew South American position. He was an air advisor in, in South America. He drew just interesting assignments and had wonderful kids who just did, did so well. And every time I see them, I'm, I embarrass them to death by telling them what, what a great guy I think he was and, and the depth to which I am grateful to him for the saving of my life. So there was that segment, and, uh, and, and it was unusual 
the high percentage of, of the people who were involved in public service. Uh, uh, there are plenty of them became, uh, or one of them uh, f formed uh, the uh, International House of Pancakes, and, and uh, uh, one of them became the head of a, of a design group that designed Air Force One and, and uh, just designed uh, the Ford Motor, they were the chief designer and so on. So there are all kinds of people like that, and corp presidents of corporations and banks. But a lot of them are educators and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and really did well. So they, they did well as the take charge generation. Uh, something that I think you have to think about, and, and this, is, this, is, this is not good, but the ultimate bonding experience is a war. And so we ended up upon, I knew that, that, uh, that John Brady and, and Ev Blakely, for instance, my two pilots, were my friends because I knew that they would give their lives for me. And so we, we were friends and every one of us, almost every military person that I know who's in World War II, looks back at World War II as the time he picked up his, his best friends. We, uh, the hundredth, had this awful reputation and they called it the bloody hundredth because of our terrible losses and because of all kinds of fracases and vendettas that, uh, that they thought that the, that the, uh, war, that the uh, Luftwaffe had against us. But kind of ironically, that, uh, that notoriety drew us together. So when any other bomb group has a reunion, uh, maybe 400 people come, or at, at the most 450 or 500, but most of them are around 200, and they think 200 is a good reunion. The 100th, on the other hand, has 1,000 people coming to St. Louis, and a, and a small one for us is when we're on the points of the compass and, and we're the hardest way for people to, to get there, and uh, one of them, the last one, was just 700. But that's, that's twice, as, twice and three times as much as anybody else has. And they get together and they, oh, they tell these ridiculous, silly jokes. And, and the minute you come back, every story you've ever had flows back to you. I remember um, one, wife, uh, said to his, one wife said to her husband, you know, I just can't uh, uh, understand how you can remember all those stories. You can just remember hundreds of stories, but you can't ever remember to whom you told the story. Was a typical mission life. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll handle it like a uh, start the not not so much just take off and dropping bombs and so on, but the whole the way the whole day went because it was we we were so young and we were li uh, laboring under such tremendous tension that at 7:30 the night before you'd look up uh, all over the base there was a, a light it could be a green light or a red light. And if you knew if it was a red light, you knew that the field order was in and that we were alerted for the mission the next day. They closed the bar, they closed the gates, we, and um, they uh, wouldn't let people go out that way. And so we knew we were going to fly the next day. And the field order would come in, and I was the group navigator, and I would go down and look at the field orders. And we didn't know where the target was, and, but uh, we knew what our position was, whether we were going to be the lead or the tail end charlier. So we set up the, the crew for that kind of thing and, and got the band, the, everything all ready to go. And then we went to bed, got up at about three, and, and I would do the briefing and that the crews would come, uh, just, just absolutely blurry I would sleep because it was 3.30. They'd bring, it'd be cold, they'd bring us on the, the uh, uh, big trucks, uh, uh, drop us off to briefing. They, they were the, one of the exciting moments when you'd sit, everybody sit down in a hush and they would pull a great big curtain about and you'd just follow a tape clear across and, and sometimes it would go to France and stop and you'd relax and hope for a milk run but sometimes it'd just go on and on and on and on and into Berlin and big Berlin was the big one. So we would have the briefing, go home and eat, uh, not go home and eat, but go to our quarters and eat, go to the, uh, out of the plane and get our, everybody doing his thing, the gunners cleaning their guns, me getting my map straight. And then we'd go out and taxi out, just a beautiful, beautiful sound, the throaty roar of a B-17. And we'd go out to the head of the runway and look out at the, uh, the, the, at the, uh, your field, the control tower and when they would fly, fire two green flares while off you would go. It would take us um, uh, two hours and a half to assemble 2,000 airplanes, uh, a, a, a wing at a time, a, 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 a group at a time, and then, and then we would take off and away we would go and we'd try to find the target and, uh, and that's when the mission really began. And uh, it, 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 there was a size of, of, of them. We'd have 1,000 fighters buzzing around and would have a very tough time.